Assalamu alaikum. May the peace and blessings of God be with you. Thank you for joining us today for the Muslim Cinematic Movements, Transforming Obstacles into Opportunities panel, which is hosted by Impact's Hollywood Bureau and the Islamic Scholarship Fund, ISF. I'm Sue Obeidi, the director of Impact's Hollywood Bureau. We are about to have a very rich conversation. And so for the sake of time, please visit impacthollywoodbureau.org and islamicscholarshipfund.org to learn more about who we are and what we do in the entertainment industry. On behalf of MPAC and ISF, I'd like to extend our gratitude to our friends at the Sundance Film Festival who have helped make today's panel a reality. Specifically, I would like to thank Mary Sadegi, Melinda Garcia, Divya Kohli, and Sydney Ritter. Before I turn it over to our moderator, as much as I can, I'd like to address the elephant in the room surrounding today's panel. For decades, the entertainment industry, including film festivals in the US and across the globe, provide an opportunity for filmmakers to showcase their creative work that will hopefully change the world for the better by telling stories about people, communities, and issues. Unfortunately, at the same time, this industry has also been inequitable to underrepresented groups. Non-dominant communities often find themselves having to face layers and layers of challenges to rectify decades of misinformation. Due to the political issues that are beyond our control, American Muslims often find themselves having to defend a faith and a community that is founded on mercy, compassion, and dignity. This is true in the policy space, and it's true in the entertainment space. The issue of inclusion of so-called Muslim characters and storylines and issues has never been an, a problem for the industry when it comes to Muslims. The industry has made billions of dollars, including us, but unfortunately, oftentimes inaccurately and inauthentically. If you ask a Muslim filmmaker why they do the, this work, most likely they will tell you that it's because they want to counter the misinformation. That's a tall order and so unfair to them. The events of 9-11 forced the Muslim creative community to rise up and defend themselves and their faith through the arts. They did not ask for this, but we couldn't be more prouder of them for rising to the challenge. The conversation around authorship, who can and should tell stories will continue to be debated through the years, but true change will not happen without a shakeup. A few years ago, the world changed forever because social justice movements shifted the landscape once again. And while it may not happen as quickly as we want it to, what the industry got away with in the past, one day will no longer be acceptable. There's a new generation of filmmakers at the helm who are transforming obstacles into opportunities. They will not be denied and nor should they be. Impact's Hollywood Bureau has benefited from elevating its work through organizing panels at film and television festivals. And I have no doubt that our industry partners have benefited from learning from our panelists and our community throughout the years. These events are a conduit to building bridges because we cannot do it without you and you cannot do it right without us. Programming choices at festivals set the tone for what our industry deems acceptable. Oftentimes these choices perpetuate story types and the vilification of communities. This is not to say that this is the intention, but this is the reality. If industry decision makers who are gate openers are eager for change, then we look to you to not only ask who's at the table, who is let in, but also ask who isn't and should be. And if you are not sure, you know where to find us to find out. And with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Serene Sawaf, who is a board member of MPAC and attorney in the LA area. Serene? Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto all of you. I'm so grateful to moderate this panel of incredible Muslim creatives on behalf of MPAC and ISF. The Muslim Public Affairs Council has been outreaching to the entertainment industry for about 30 years, 
honoring Spike Lee for his honest and nuanced portrayal of Malcolm X in 1993, and just last year honoring the director and producer of The Mauritanian for their insightful and powerful production based on an inspiring true story of Mohamed al Slahi, a Guantanamo Bay detainee, and his fight for freedom from wrongful imprisonment at Guantanamo Bay. MPAC Hollywood Bureau is honored to partner here today with the Islamic Scholarship Fund, the first Muslim organization to fund filmmakers and help support, uplift, and spotlight Muslim creatives for the last 15 years. The Pew Research Center conducted a study last year of how the experiences of Muslim Americans and attitudes towards Muslims and Islam in America overall have changed in the last two decades since the terrorist attacks of 9-11. As the Muslim population has grown, so too have acts of animus and discrimination, despite small gains such as having the first Muslim congressperson, the first Muslim judge elected to the bench. So while Americans have negative views towards Muslims and Islam, 53% say they don't personally know anyone who is Muslim, and 52% say they know not much or nothing at all about Islam. Americans who are not Muslim and who personally know someone who is Muslim are more likely to have a positive view of Muslims and less likely to believe that Islam encourages violence more than other religions. And this just touches on explicit bias. In recent years, industries, agencies, companies have lent an ear towards the existence of implicit bias, recognizing that everyone, no matter what socially constructed category they fall into, carries some level of implicit bias because what we experience and what we are exposed to forms patterns in our minds. It's the way we associate and categorize people. And here is why, one reason why film is so important. Film is often the introduction of the public to a particular community. And to have voices that are authentic, that genuinely truly understand the nuances in the community are absolutely critical. I'm now going to turn into honoring uh, and introducing our incredible panelists. I'll start with Sami Khan, an Oscar nominated filmmaker whose work in fiction and documentary has been supported by the Sundance and Tribeca film industries, Rooftop Films, The Gotham, the NBC Universal's Director Fellowship, MPAC and the Islamic Scholarship Fund. His films have screened at leading festivals, including Tribeca, Toronto, Hot Docs and Mumbai. Sami's upcoming short doc, Angel Dose is supported by the ISF and tells the story of a heroic Philadelphia-born American, Muslim American nurse. Welcome, Sammy. Queen Muhammad Ali is an award-winning film director, television producer, and visual anthropologist. Ali's film, Bars for Justice, starring Common and Talib Kweli, screened twice at the prestigious Muslim, excuse me, Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, Glasgow, Scotland, and Beijing, China. Her recent film, Coming Up Short, is an award-winning documentary feature about a member of the controversial platinum rap group, Da Lynch Mob. Welcome, Queen. Thank you. Hakeem Khalik. Hakeem Khalik is an award-winning film director, television, television producer, and visual anthropologist. Before his career in film and television, he worked as a music producer and radio personality. Hakeem's recent film, Coming Up Short, is a powerful documentary feature about the controversial platinum rap group led De Lynch mob led by Ice Cube. Welcome, Hakeem. Salam alaikum, everyone. Thank you. Alaikum salam. Iman Zawahri is one of the first hijabi American Muslim filmmakers in the nation. She's an Emmy Award winning Princess Grace Award recipient and a Lincoln Center NYFF Artist Academy Fellow. She is also the co-creator of the first American Muslim film grant with Islamic Scholarship Fund, where she currently serves as director of film pro programs. Her debut film, Americanish, is currently touring the festival circuit and has won 14 awards, including Best Director and Best Film. Welcome, Iman. Excited to be here, thank you. Kamal Bilal is an African-American filmmaker based in the Midwest. He was named one of the 25 new faces of independent film in 2018 by Filmmaker Magazine. His short film, Baby Brother, held its world premiere at Sundance in 2018. He's currently writing and developing his first action, excuse me, first fiction feature film, 
Welcome, Kamal. Mona Daria is an event programming specialist at MPEX Hollywood Bureau. Her work amplifies kindred stories at the intersection of Black Muslim and Black diaspora communities. Her screenwriting explores ideas of belonging and kinship. In 2021, she was a writer in residence at the Norman Jewison Film Program. Welcome, Mona. Alaikum, thank you. Alaikum salam. And Tarek El Baba is an Arab American filmmaker with over 19 years of experience. Tarek has produced series, documentaries, and hour long specials for premium networks and studios. His creative work has been featured on Discovery Channel, National Geographic, History Channel, Spike TV, NBC, Facebook Watch, and Apple TV. Plus, Tarek has developed original content for distribution, including a feature documentary about the tragic Chapel Hill murders of 2015, and a scripted film focusing on his grandparents' struggle for survival during the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948 in Palestine. Welcome, Tarek. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We are so grateful to have you, and let's jump in, everybody. Um, And by jump in, I mean, take a moment to breathe. <laughs> I wanna start by taking a step back. We have this platform and we're so grateful to have a platform to showcase you. We wanna know about you. Tell us about your journey, particularly how you were able to get your film financed as a Muslim creative. In light of our incredible panel of seven, I just ask every person to condense your remarks to two minutes tops. Great, um, I'll, I'll start. Um, I was able to get financing from my film through the Norman Jewison Film Program. I've been working on one feature for about six to seven years. And I know a lot of people who are listening know what it's like to like carry a project through for years and years. And what I was able to do through that program was get some mentorship, but also execute and have like BIPOC creatives and um, first time actors, people from the Somali community. I was able to do it in my own language. Um, I know today we're talking about financing. We're talking about transforming obstacles. And I don't think that would have been possible without like a support of like a structured program. So that was my experience. Well, I mean, I can just say for me and um, our film, um, we were um, financing it through uh, our uh, own business endeavors uh, as far as we can go. And then a good friend of us, of ours, uh, told us about ISF and um, that helped us out a lot. Um, matter of fact, it's almost like became our second um, funding friends. <laughs> Um, so that helped us a lot with uh, Islamic Scholarship Foundation with their um, film uh, scholarship that helped a lot. And then, of, of course, just um, really just working for three and a half years on the film, you know, you're going to get to the point where, you know, things start to come. We also had another partner who uh, has a company and he just started to uh, help us out with some of the, the funding of the film. So it was self-financed and everything is literally independent at this point, so same thing here. Thank you, Hakeem. Um, I'm gonna, I'll jump in now. I just wanna say, I'm super excited to be on the panel, everyone. Thank you to um, Suna Sh Shireen. I really uh, resonated a lot your opening remarks, so I appreciate that. Um, so it took me eight years to make my film. It, it's a comedy, a romantic comedy about some Muslim women. And it was such a challenge, like, I, we had made it a goal, me and my creative partner, Isa Fatima, that we were gonna get only Muslim investors, which everybody knows in the room is like impossible because they don't <laughs> invest in the beautiful arts. So like we traveled the nation like for four years, pitching, pitching, pitching. And people were like, oh, you guys are cute. That's nice, that's great. And then finally the people that invested in us ended up being our close friends and family who, um, have been watching our careers for a long time and were able to pull through. And another thing that was really amazing is um, people of color, particularly Muslim women have been um, the ones that have been uplifting us the most. And 90% of our investors are actually Muslim women. And that was actually probably the problem that we thought of before we were going out like looking for um, like 
you know, rich men or whatnot <laughs> to, to invest in our film. And it ended up being all of our amazing um, female um, strong women that uh, invested in the film. And now we're like really proud to say that 100% of our film was invested by American and UK Muslims, which is really, really exciting. So um, that has been um, our journey in our film. I'm gonna pass it along to you, Tariq. Assalamu alaikum. Um, you know, for a feature documentary I'm working on, it, it was a story that hit close to home. I grew up in North Carolina and uh, my story is about the tragic murders in, in Chapel Hill. Three Muslim students were killed by their neighbor. Um, you know, I created a treatment. I had a good game plan. I researched for a few months, but like so many filmmakers, you got to kind of self-finance at first to you know, to, to prove that, uh, that you're in it for the long haul, that it's more than just an idea on paper. Everyone's got an idea. So, you know, we charged a credit card, <laughs> flew out to North Carolina, shot for seven days in a row. It's a really intense uh, first round of pr principal photography. But once we came back, you know, we were able to put together, <clears throat> you know, a scissor reel and apply to grants like the ISF grant, which was super helpful. Um, and, you know, I will say a lot of grant, grant cycles, they take a really long time. I mean, it could, it could be an, a year before you actually hear from folks um, and start to get decisions. But I will say it was a pretty streamlined process. And by the time we actually got the funding, it really helped at a critical moment. Uh, and, and, you know, as we were developing and producing our project. So, you know, throughout the years, it's just been a constant cycle of, you know, research, develop, shoot, edit and apply to grants. Um, the biggest thing that, that was helpful for me was finding somebody in our community who also believed in the project as much as I did. And that person was able to help us get like a fiscal sponsor, for instance, with Filmmakers Collaborative, um, helping us with fundraising. And, and you know, it's, it's hard for filmmakers to take all of that on. I mean, working on creative is a full-time job. Fundraising is another full-time job, creating websites and, and outreach. So we can't do it alone. We need uh, amazing partners and EPs that, that can kind of champion the project. So I was lucky to find that. Great. Queen, can I kick it to you? Um, sure. Well, as you know, uh, Hakeem and I have a film that are, is together and I wanted to second what he was saying, but also what Tariq, uh, Tariq was saying about um, being able to, you know, kind of have to prove yourself um, as a, a filmmaker, but not only as a filmmaker, as a Muslim filmmaker, and as someone that can actually put a story together. Um, one thing that I would say that we had that was good for us is that we already had, did documentary work before. We already had a, a short film that we did with um, Talib Kweli and some other uh, uh, artists coming. And it was focusing on the same thing, kind of like social justice. And so it was it, it helped us to be able to um, apply for uh, funding. And um, I would just suggest if anyone is, you know, starting out, if they could uh, make sure that your work is not only commercial work, like if you're doing, you know, music videos or commercials, you want to make sure that you do at least like a short, short film or something like that, where you can prove that you can tell the story and it, it'll help with getting funding. And so that's what we did. Um, of course, um, ISF was our, our main funder. And then we had other, uh, uh, just like uh, Iman said, friends, family that also believed in our work and also a partner that helped us with funding it. We didn't take, you know, it didn't take us as long as Iman, but, <laughs> um, and, and it's because it's a, you know, shorter film, it's a, a, um, a documentary feature. But um, definitely going through all those avenues and being able to uh, hash out your your uh, script and everything and be, being able to tell that story really helps with the funding process. Great. Kamal, can you share a little bit about yourself, your journey? Yeah, uh, it's nice to be here with everybody and see all these, these great faces. So, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Um, so for me, I guess each project has been a little bit different in terms of getting money for it or whether or not there was money even for it. <laughs> um, a lot of the short documentary stuff um, has obviously always started, I think, 
by you. Um, I think one was sort of unique in that we had, it was some commercial work that we were doing for um, uh, a company and it sort of rolled into a piece where she was gonna fund us to do a short film. So that was one, that was one way. Um, another way when I was previously, I was working at the university and I, I got a grant through the university that you know funded a, a short fiction film. I actually partnered with another Muslim filmmaker who works at a university and we pulled our grant money together and we just kind of put together, he had a script to put something together and went and shot it and then just sort of used whatever sort of situation you're in currently to whatever kind of advantage you can. So, and then other ways, obviously, I think it's just the, the most important thing and it's been said already is just kind of like using your own sort of energy to get something off the ground and then problem solving as you go through it. You know, there's some great residencies at the time Point North, Point, Point North Institute had a short form editing residency that I went through, uh, which was just, uh, those are little stepping stones that make you feel like, okay, this thing has some legs and it's moving. You know what I mean? It's not just me moving it. Um, so looking for residencies and things that have like deadlines that give you like concrete ways to like keep making um, movement on it, so. Great, Sammy. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, if I knew when I was starting out how much time I would spend on contracts and like different forms of contracts, I would have paid a lot more attention in whatever pre-law, although I didn't take pre-law. But I mean, I think you have to take like a varied approach. So I raised money with private equity, public broadcast money, grants like the ISF, um, but then also, you know, media companies and whatnot. Um, and I think it's sort of, uh, you have to have that varied approach, but it, you know, the other thing that I want to talk about a little bit is like it uh, even if there's like a bunch of us who are creatives um, and or actors in front of the camera, there's still going to be uh, it's still going to be hard because at the executive level um, behind the scenes, the people making decisions are still overwhelmingly white, over, still overwhelmingly male. Um, and I think, you know, you can see these problems manifest themselves um, even now, even after this sort of reckoning or whatever the cliche they talk about the last two, five years. Um, so there needs to be change on the executive level. There need to, needs to be more people of color, more Muslims, more women um, in executive levels, in, in, in critics roles. Um, and the, the other thing I think to mention is that the, the sort of the, the tension and representation, right, is like, okay, so I have a career, this is good for me, I'm gonna use this. Um, in this kind of capitalist endeavor, which we're all in, but you know, I'll keep quiet whenever there's like a difficult issue that actually causes me to, you know, risk something and put my neck on the line. Um, and so I think that's really important to keep in mind. It's not just about one person, you know, getting an award, getting like a big budget film. It's about systemic change to, uh, you know, to really bring about a radical transformation of the the way Americans view Muslims, uh, you know, so eloquently, Serene, you and Sue sort of teed us up with that, that yeah. fact of the sort of Muslims being viewed as a threat, and yet nobody knows us. And the, the images that they're getting are from Hollywood screens, which are dominated by war and terrorism. So as we progress, as we sort of get a foothold in the industry, let's make sure that it's, you know, it's, it's sustainable, that it's broad based, that we're lifting up the next generation and not only the next generation, but the generation that came before us um, who maybe ran into a door like repeatedly, but paved the way um, for us to come through and have these opportunities. Wonderful. So I want to know now what the largest obstacle has been, you know, what have you faced as filmmakers and how do we overcome that challenge? All right, so um, I will start off with this. So um, it's an interesting, um, my biggest challenge has always been telling comedies in the independent realm. So comedies, um, as we know in independent film festivals, they really like dramas particularly in communities of color, they like dramas. And then, you know, what we lovely like to call trauma porn. And there's a recent example of this in the documentary Jihad Rehab, which premiered at this year's festival. And I really wanna take a minute to talk about this because it's very important to our community. 
This documentary, for those of you who don't know, is about men who were tortured in Guantanamo, taken to a rehab, rehab facility in Saudi Arabia to get acclimated to the real world. And it was made by a non-Muslim filmmaker. So watching this film was very traumatic for me. Um, it brought up all the emotions of anxiety that I felt up growing up, um, dealing with these typical stereotypes of Muslims as being dangerous and evil. And of course, my favorite stereotype that women have no voice and are oppressed. So when I watch a documentary, and I would hope everybody's like this, um, I wanna be taken on a personal journey of a character to empathize, relate, and to learn. And this documentary really missed that mark. You know, when you are a filmmaker, you take the large responsibility of telling a story of a community that you do not represent. We need to know the intent and what your goal is. And again, the film is the mark. So as you see these men struggling in the film, the filmmaker would ask leading questions like, is that why you fought in Afghanistan? Or you don't have any money now, did you get money in Afghanistan? Like these questions operated under the, her framing and messaging, which was in line of the same like recycled stereotypes that has existed pre 9-11 and exacerbated post 9-11, um, framing these stereotypes, continually pushing the narrative that focuses on violence and terrorism and not whether these men were possibly wrongfully accused and tortured in Guantanamo, but just constantly the leading questions perpetuating a dangerous brown man stereotype. So when you make stories like these that have multi-Islamophobic comics and tropes, they dangerously impact the Muslim community, not you the filmmaker, as you have no stake in this game. Jihad Rehab, the title itself is incredibly Islamophobic. It is meant to incite the already plaguing stereotypes that are held in our community. And so this film didn't offer any substance to the film world or to our communities. And everything that Sue and Sammy and um, Serene were saying in the beginning was incredibly important is, you know, what we need to be doing is understanding and celebrating these per personal stories of everybody on this panel, these filmmakers here that are telling amazing authentic stories that have the multifaceted of Muslim experience. Like the ISF supportive film with Hakeem and Queen made that I love so much, a documentary called Coming Up Short, which is a true story of um, a black Muslim shorty who was a legendary member of the lynch mob and uh Tarek al Baba who's telling the story of the three Muslim um, people that students that were shot in Carolina and then of course Sammy's documentary Angel Dosh which tells the story of a heroic Philadelphia born Muslim nurse during the pandemic like these are the stories we need to uplift program fund and support and more more representative of who we are in our communities and our experience Sammy I want to pass it along to you to hear your thoughts as well yeah, thanks so much, Iman. I really appreciate that. That was really uh, powerfully said. Um, so, you know, some of you here may know, some of you may not know, but, uh, you know, I have publicly gone on the record. I've seen the film. I've publicly gone on the record um, with my concerns about the film. And I'm part of a sort of crisis working group of doc filmmakers uh, led mostly by Muslim women um, and uh, who have uh, serious concerns about the film, both the text of the film itself, but then the filmmaking ethics behind it, where um, you know, I think we were concerned and disturbed in December when the film was announced at uh, you know Sundance in December. But now I'm even more troubled by the recklessness with which the the filmmakers seem to have approached the men's the subject's safety um, and. Uh, you know, and then, you know, there's sort of been a, a kind of backlash in the trade press and the sort of main, mainstream trade press where criticism from the Muslim community, some of you, you know, uh, on the panel and out there, um, there's been a kind of backlash, a white lash in the press, um, sort of, I don't know what it is, it's like the cliches of the, the woke mob and hasn't engaged in any of the substance of criticism, which has come from not just Arab and Muslim filmmakers, but experts in the field including filmmakers who have made films about Guantanamo, uh, you know, hum human rights workers at Human Rights Watch. Um, and, you know, I, uh, you know, some of the, the sort of working group and some of you who have raised concerns are very respected members, not just of the documentary film community, but of the film community more broadly. Um, and again, there's like a sort of tension here too, where it's like, we're talking about this film, uh, but we don't want to give it too much air, right? So what do we, how do we balance that role and that responsibility? Um, and I think the thing we all know, we all wonder about is like, could you tell a film about another community like this in this way? Um, and I, know, I don't know the answer to that question. Certainly the white lash and these trade articles recently are, are really troubling. 
Um, and there's a couple of substantive points that I that I just want to go through if you just humor me. Um, because there is like, you know, a group of us who are working together and we want to expand our group, we want to build community. And that's like one actionable thing. Um, we're gonna, um, you know, we're gonna have concrete action items that are, you know, that are positive. And uh, uh, later when I get a second, I'll drop a sign up thing in the chat um, where we're pursuing like an op-ed or an open letter, um, which we would love to have uh, you all sign up to. Um, and then a kind of fun way, I, you know, one thing we were thinking about is like, is there a way to kind of spin this, um, you know, give an opportunity to platform our voices. I mean, use a hashtag like hashtag my Muslim film to talk about the films that don't get platformed at Sundance. Um, you know, whether it's our films here, the young folks, older folks. Um, so again, I'll, I'll drop that in the chat um, in, a, in a second and, uh, you know, let's all, stay in touch on social media and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but like, as Iman said, like the text of the film is incredibly troubling and Islamophobic. Like uh, 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 Marjan Safini has made this point. It's like a signpost. The title is like, it's not for us, right? It's like, it's meant to offend Muslims. It's like, this film is not for you. Um, and then like Iman said, the, the filmmaker takes the role of interrogator where she's deciding who's a good Muslim and who's a bad Muslim. And we all know the last 20 years how that sort of frame of extremism has been used to quite uh, literally destroy our communities um, and to, uh, you know, and, and now has increasingly been um, fodder for extremists. You know, yesterday was the anniversary of the Quebec City mosque shooting. Um, you know, it's six months since a family in London, Ontario were murdered. Um, the, this is like, this is something that we live with every day. Um, and then, you know, so the, the, concretely, I have seen the film, I've engaged in the film, um, but, you know, the primary concern is the safety of the men in the film, and the filmmakers have not done their due diligence. Um, you know, th this is like a, we know things, we hear things, but the, the film claims to quote unquote humanize these men, and the filmmaker themselves admitted as recently as two days ago on the pages of Variety that the men themselves haven't seen the film. Yeah. So how can, you, how can you be granting someone humanity when you won't even grant them agency in their own lives to assess the risks that this film may pose for them? Um, so that kind of recklessness is troubling. And there are groups, you know, whether it's the Center for Constitutional Rights or the ACLU or MPAC, you know, groups who work in this space that you know could have been approached years ago, um, and you know this film did not come out of nowhere. Some of us have been aware of the project and voiced concerns about the project for years, going back to 2019. Um, I was in the IFP doc lab with the film, so is Ishan Ali, my friend. Um, you know, uh, Jude Shahab was in a lab with this. Concerns were voiced over the years. So to pretend that like, again, the trades are making this out to be like, oh, this is just new criticism. It's, it's not. If there was an attempt to engage in good faith on concerns Muslims and Arabs had about this film, it could have been done years and years ago. Um, another thing to mention again, apologies, but this is, you know, this is our community. I just gonna, I, I wanna take the opportunity to inform you all because yeah. we're all invested in this. Yeah. Um, there are people who are walking away from the film who uh, some knew they were going to be credited, some did not know they were going to be listed in the credits of the film. When they saw the film, they were horrified. When they saw the title, they walked away. Um, I think that's an important thing to, to know, as well as like the institutions, some institutions, prominent institutions backed this film, but some in institutions did not. Like, you know, the Sundance Film Festival programmed this film but the Sundance Doc Institute did not grant funding to this film and other doc institutions which have sort of code of ethics did not. And why is that? Why is there this sort of commercial establishment space that kind of platform a deeply problematic film without you know, key Muslim creatives on the team um, while you know, we're kind of, our criticism is dismissed. Um, and of course, you know, to kind of step out wide and end my mini rant, you apologies, um, which is uh, it's taken laser focus because there's like Moana going on over here and my daughters are rampaging and staring at me. So this is like, a, I feel kind of like, a, you know, Kobe trying to stay in the zone here, but I'm not Kobe. So I'm doing my best. 
but the other thing is like the numbers, right? And this is what we all suspect, but we haven't seen concretely. Um, and we've looked at the numbers on in the doc competition, uh, US documentaries and world documentaries. Um, and the overwhelming majority of films that are programmed at Sundance are about with Muslims are about war and terror. Um, there are only four films in the last 20 years about the uh, Arab American or Muslim American experience in the United States. Only four films. But think about that. There is like, you know, I can think of two Michael Jackson films in the last 20 years. There's like a Taylor Swift film and a Billie Eilish film in the last couple of years. You know, those celebrities get their shot, but you know, the dynamics of Muslim Americans and broader, you know, mainstream American culture has been one of the biggest tensions. And why is it that our voices are continually marginalized? Um, and, uh, you know, but again, I'm like inspired because this, this group led overwhelmingly by Muslim, I'm, you know, talking to you now, but it's like, you know, the Muslim women in our group are hustling, uh, doing all the lion's share of the work. Um, and uh, I'm inspired by just the response. So uh, I think let's, let's not let this film in particular dominate this year, the, be the Muslim film of the year, but let's find a way to elevate each, each other's voices and do it in a positive way. Um, so yeah, end mini rant. I have to say too, it's like, it's hard for me and, and I imagine it's hard for all of you to talk about this stuff, right? It's like so raw, like just thinking about the, we, I have to talk about this, like not the Quebec City monster, not honoring the men who died six, uh, five years ago. It's like, we can't hold space for this. We have to fight back. And for the yeah. industry not to get that in 2022, I mean, it's just heartbreaking. Um, yeah. So concretely, we'll drop like the, 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 the sign up uh, Google sheet that uh, Razi has done in, in the chat. Um, we'll, uh, and let's get that hashtag going tomorrow, like 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, My Muslim Film. Let's get our stories out there and um, get a positive vision of Muslims and, and, and change the conversation. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. Um, I think you're hitting on so many critical issues and I don't want to belabor the point, but when it comes to ethical, authentic, um, honest and accurate representations, particularly with um, topics that are more challenging, more nuanced, that are misunderstood in the mainstream, how critical is it for Muslims to be involved? I mean, you know, there is, is it all or nothing? I'm gonna throw this question out to the panel. Well, I think if you think of what Sammy and Iman said and like just to hold space, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, uh, I think about just like hearing from them, it makes me think about like the importance of like definitely platforming our voices. And when we think of like the largest obstacles that exist for Muslim filmmakers, it's like this need not only for agency in our own lives, but the challenge for Muslim filmmakers to try to like elevate the voices of others in our community and illuminate our, our common humanity, like in a world that's often, that often vilifies us. So this idea of this hashtag, my Muslim film, I think that's such a, great actionable step forward. So thank you, uh, Semi, for that offering. And, and I'm hoping that uh, many of us participate in that in that positive conversation. I'm so I'm so moved by everything that you said, Sami, and I thank you so much and applaud to every one of you yes. that are doing this. Um, Asia, Amber, uh, Jude, Marjan, I don't want to miss anybody's name, but thank you so much for all, all doing this. And um, you know, we're talking about funding a lot, and this is what this is for, because Impact's been doing this work for 30 years, like wow. uplifting the voices. We have been for, we have been funding Muslim filmmakers for the first time for the past 15 years. I was the first, their first ever film um, recipient. And so the funding channels that you had mentioned, like, you know, we mentioned Sundance programming, but Gotham and Film Independent, which are organizations that we love, fund these type of programs is very problematic. And Serene, to answer your question, of course, as hardcore Iman is going to be, yeah, every Muslim needs to speak out about it, and I don't want to hear any excuses about it. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, I want I want to say something. Um, I really uh, thank you, uh, Iman and uh, Sammy, for what you said, and I know it's difficult for us to because 
when you say something, then you're that person we don't want to work with, right? So it's very, you know, um, heroic that you do that. I just wanted to just share that, you know, one of the biggest films in American history is The Birth of a Nation. And that was like the worst stereotypical portrayal of Black people. And it led to like, I don't know how many countless of lynchings. So, you know, you have to understand like filmmaking is a, is a responsibility that, that you have to have. You know, I, I, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. So for me to tell the story about Shorty, you know, who was a Muslim who changed his life, you know, you just can't come out of the outside and, and tell those type of stories. And when you do, you're always going to put in something that has nothing to do with that community that is going to uh, push that other narrative. So it's very important that we state that because there's too many other stories and too many other you know, um, possibilities that can be out there not always push the same stereotypical, you know, ridiculous um, rhetoric, you know, so I, I, I think that's a, a great uh, place to, to, to voice it. And I hope Sundance is listening, you know, and everybody else, you know, cans, whoever, you know, and, and, and the, the, the distributors, you know, they should all be listening, you know. I mean, I don't, it's, there's so much, I don't know, I mean, how, how do we even tackle where, what are concrete steps that can be taken, you know, from here? We need, I feel like we need more institutions that, um, that could address these from the, from the position of storytelling that isn't told from, I guess the perspective here is like the white gaze, right? Um, we need more institutions that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised that films like this are still being made. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is like about imperialism and colonization. You know, it's, this is, until, until that is not a thing, this will always be a thing, right? So what we need really, if we're talking about this, having these conversations are institutions um, that, that don't proceed in that way, right? And so we gotta, we gotta have, like we, man was saying earlier, she went around Fund, looking funding from her films and you know couldn't get it from the community right so we need more institutions that are coming from yes you know our communities to to support this work if i mean we understand uh how important it is and what the visual because you're as a minority you understand what when people say oh like what they know about you all they've seen is a film um you understand <laughs> because you feel the impact of it when you walk into the bank right or you go to the cashier or whatever it is um, when you're in that, and that's, that's the way it is as, as a minority. I don't know, you know, if that actually shifts the, the world is sort of, the gaze is always right now, right? It's this, this sort of white European gaze. So uh, one, I guess one concrete step, at least from what I can see is just, you know, having more institutions that um, support, you know, Muslim filmmaking work uh, of, of just of minorities, people who are, who are making that, who are doing those things, so. I'd like to just add, um, you know, when, when you say institutions, I think we should uh, be specific with production companies. You know, I've, I've seen a few and I've heard a few that are popping up, but we need production companies that can hear our pitches, that can help us develop, that have connections to distribution. I mean, the elephant in the room is uh, a premium documentary. The budgets are between four hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars and $700,000, right? So it's too much for an organization like ISF or some of the other grants that we apply to, to fund the whole thing, right? So we have to spend so much time and energy, years, in fact, applying for grants just to make our films. And I'm, I'm super thankful for those organizations. I'm super thankful for being able to apply to these grants and get that support. But if you're trying to make a project in a timely manner with a subject matter that is timely and relevant, I mean, it's pretty much impossible. I mean, I, I don't, I hate to be pessimistic, but it's really challenging. And so, you know, we need more production companies out there who can connect those dots, who will hear our pitches. And frankly, that's been the frustration within our own community is that we have, we all have our projects. We all have, you know, things that we want to produce and direct and push, but we need to support each other as much as we can. And I feel like, you know, if any of you guys succeed, we can all succeed as well. And we need to remind ourselves that good material rises to the top. 
Yes. And although that documentary is absolutely problematic from what I hear, I have not seen it. A lot of us have not seen it yet. But I think we just need to make really incredible films and create a lot of noise and use our built-in right. institutions and network to help us promote our projects. Like the work doesn't stop. We still as creatives need to roll up our sleeves and create the absolute best projects we can, period. Yes, right. right. And um, I wanted to add on to what Tariq and also Kamal was saying um, about institutions, definitely production companies. We, uh, that's something that we definitely need and distribution. We need people that are in our community that are in charge of distribution. Um, and just thinking about, you know, the Jewish community, um, if something like this were to come out negative towards them, it would be labeled anti-Semitic. It would probably, that person would be out of the industry, period. So I feel that, you know, as Muslims, we can also have that kind of impact if we all work together and also, you know, get into those um, institutions or, or create those institutions. So definitely I, I see, you know, where, you know, we as, as a community can be more stronger in these areas because we have so much talent and so many creatives that have all these ideas and want to portray not only ourselves as a certain way, but just telling good stories. Um, but we don't have that, uh, like we said, we don't have these institutions in place or we don't have enough repre re representation at these institutions for us to move forward as fast as, as we will, would like to move forward. Great, so just before um, we take uh, questions from the audience, I wanna ask everyone to take a minute to think about how MPAC and ISF have both supported you in, in building a creative pipeline to share your particular narratives. Hakeem, you start. Yeah, I was gonna start with <laughs> Hakeem. <laughs> How'd you do that? <laughs> Oh, you're on mute, Hakeem. I said, I, I'm just, I'm just going to just keep it real 100. You know, um, ISF is the truth, you know, and um, seriously, I mean, I love Iman. I love the whole team out there because when we didn't have nobody, I mean, we didn't even really think of our film as a Muslim, you know, film. We just like, we know Shorty, this film needs to be made. He was sick. Let's do this film. Let's work on it. And when it got to the point where we needed help, you know, we started finding uh, organizations and, and people were like, literally like not even, so we have Wistia, right? And I'm not trying to give them a commercial because I don't, I'm not endorsing them in any kind of way, but as a cool platform where you can send someone your link and you can see if they watched it. So I'm looking at these film festivals that saying, oh yeah, we denied you, but you never watched the film. You just saw my name and was like, oh, I'm out. So you, you see that type of stuff. And then I'm like, oh, it's a, this crap film that I'm looking at. I'm like, this is just made on an iPhone and you, that, got, that got, you know. So we started seeing those things, but ISF was, the, was like the totally different. It was like the, it was just totally different. And I, I really, really um, love them, you know, because it made us feel that, um, that this could be made because we we got funding from ISF early on, and I thought that that was very encouraging for us. And uh, before Shorty had passed away, he got that. He saw that. Wow. Okay, man, this is this is good. And so it it really impacted our our film tremendously, and um, it made us to really uh, hold fast and to wait and to get a little bit more into it. And so I think uh, ISF for that, and I and, and Iman. I mean, she's a sweetheart, but it, because she's so, she didn't even have to have us to be on this particular forum. She's the one at Sundance right now. She's doing what she's doing and she brought the rest of the people with her with impact. And I think that that's, that's, that's brotherhood and love and, and sisterhood and show love. And that's what a community is supposed to be. It's about, about caring for the next person like Sammy and, and uh, others have said. You, you, you have to bring the other ones with you. And that's what I think ISF has done uh, for a queen and I with this film. And I, I mean, I wish we, 
you know, we've been telling other people about about it, but I think they just think that oh, this is going to get us to run around. But you know, they they've been real with us, you know. So I, I like I said, I'm keeping 100. <laughs> awesome. Yep. Yep. Um, Lena, I'm going to kick it to you. Did you say Muno? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to take, uh, this has just been such an inspiring conversation. I'm just like so grateful to be in community with all of you. I wanted to take my little bit of time to tell you um, because I, I, I love the work that I'm doing at Impact about some upcoming deadlines and some programs that um, might be able to support some of the things we've been talking about today, about like getting our project started, getting them off the ground, getting the kind of support we need. Um, the Black Muslim Filmmakers Grant, which is made possible with the support of CA, the CAA Foundation and its full story initiative. The deadline for that has been extended to March 30th, 2022. So we hope that you'll apply. It's the second annual Muslim list um, with partnership with Pillars Fund and the Blacklist is also accepting applications until February 28th, 2022. And um, this year too, we've had like the Warner Media inaugural and uh, boot camp, um, Warner Media Access Boot Camp. So hopefully we hope that'll happen again next year. We've also started with Film Independent, our Muslim fellowship, which allows a Muslim screenwriter to work on their craft. Um, and so hopefully you'll check out the Impact Hollywood website, Hollywood Bureau website, uh, to see the many ways that we are working to support Muslim filmmakers um, to make their dreams come true and to create the kind of stories that we all want to see. Yes, and to piggyback off of Mona, um, I really like, thank you so much, Hakeem, for all of your, the, the most positive, like, I love you, but truly like my feedback, because Hakeem here, like, <laughs> he's like, great. Um, <laughs> I really want to shout out hugely to Impact because Impact only, like you said, the only reason why we are here and why you all are here from ISF is because Impact invited us here from the wow, Muslim House to because you, they saw the work that ISF's doing, which in the filmmaking community we all see, but the work that ISF is doing has been really hard. So an Impact um, to always takes filmmakers, uplift their voice, completely helping supporting my films and everything else as well. I also want to talk about deadlines for ISF too. Um, we have our um, film grants, which is open to narrative and doc filmmakers that's opening up in April as well. And we have other fellowships and labs that will be coming on later in this year too. And if you have any questions, you can um, look at our website, uh, islamicscholarship.org, or you can email me at film at islamicscholarshipfund.org. All right, I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. We have so many audience questions coming in. So I'm going to turn to that. Um, and if there's anything you left out, find a way to incorporate them into these <laughs> answers. Okay. Um, so we've got a question from Abdi Muhammad, who writes, I'm working on a scripted show as a technical consultant, and I've been brought to, an, to authenticate the story of Somali Muslims. How do you balance telling a tr story true to the Muslim experience and not dilute it for a wider, wider audience how do you also avoid centering adding white characters lovers friends observers to make this for a broader audience i want people to see us but not work for their approval he answered his own question <laughs> <laughs> i personally think that uh you know it's the whole reason why we're doing this right why these institutions are coming together i mean we we Yes, at one point, I think Hollywood, you know, is saying, yep, you need a white actor or a bankable actor to, to get this finance. But I think there are other films and TV series. I mean, look at uh, Squid Games on Netflix. I'm just smashing records, smashing. Name one recognizable white actor in that series. Anybody? I mean, so like, there's no more excuses, guys. Just like, we have to do the work. I keep, I keep saying that. Um, I, I had this uh, workshop actually through MPAC and we met uh, some really incredible agents and one of them said during the meeting, good material always rises to the top. Yeah. So just stay true to your story, stay true to your characters and make the best uh, script, the best project you possibly can. Yeah. And I will say that uh, one, one thing I wanted to add earlier was, you know, with MPAC and ISF, they're, they've just been so supportive and so positive and fun and and they really want to see us succeed. I mean, they in their bones, you could feel it. The people that they've connected us to um, having, you know, calling us after workshops or, you know, really long day at some of these um, 
networking events that we've done just to check in, just to make sure that we, we have that support. Um, I can't thank you guys enough. It's, it's been really awesome to, to get to know all of you and, and to have that support. Thanks. Our honor as well. I could speak for MPAC and ISF <laughs> in, that, in that regard. Um, okay, we'll take another question. On the topic of financing, are there any good aggregated sources of funding? Grants, financers, et cetera. It all seems so disjointed, especially stuff for black and brown folks. You have to, you just have to really, um, like we said earlier, you have to really, um, you gotta be really believe in your project because it's gonna take some time as we get those other, uh, so as you get more funding sources. So it, that's just one of the things. I don't know of anything that, like early, I think um, uh, someone said that um, there's, no, there's no one place that you can get that whole budget for a documentary or for a film. And, and when you're talking about non-documentary, it's even gonna cost more. So you just have to really, um, uh, one of the things that, you know, is to apply for the, the MPAC, uh, apply for ISF, you know, get, you, get used to writing that particular type of synopsis or, and putting it together so you can really tell your story. That's going to help because that is going to take you to the next uh, phase of, of learning how to get financing, and how to get funded and telling your story. Because that's really where it comes down to is telling your story and making someone want to uh, help you and get it out there. So, um, but if anybody wants to get in touch with any of us, you know, fr feel free. I'm quite sure that we're all available to tell people um, what we had to experience and maybe we can help someone to next. So if anybody wanna get in touch with me, with, with me um, feel free, I'm, I'm, I'll give them all my information of what we did. I, I won't give out Iman's email unless you tell me though, you know, you know I won't do that. <laughs> <You> <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a website, No Film School. They usually put a, a yearly grant list and it has stuff for documentary and fiction. So if you Google 2022 No Film School grant list, it has like summer, spring, fall deadlines okay. and stuff. So there you go. Come on, just broke it down right there. And another way you can also, um, for that particular question, another way you can also get funding is it doesn't have to always be for a grant for particularly a documentary or for film. You can um, be more creative and apply for other types of grants, artist grants, and include um, your film as part of the art project that you're uh, working on. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, but um, also even larger grants for nonprofits. Um, a lot of nonprofits, they have so much money for um, arts projects or cultural projects. If your film falls into that category, you can also uh, wrap the a entire project around your film where it's like, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but it's like you're making, uh, you're writing a grant for arts or culture, but you're including your film as part of that project in order to, to get more funding. So you're not necessarily applying directly to a film grant. And so that's another way you can do it. And I do want to say this, this is so different. Um, we didn't get direct money from Ice Cube for our film, but he paid for certain things that was utilized in the film. So sometimes, you know, a person may not want to give you the cash, but they may be helping with something else that, you know, is necessary for reenactment or for whatever part of the production or you need to rent two airy cameras and some some Coke lenses or something, you know, so. <laughs> right. No, there are carve outs, there are ways to do it. This is great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another question uh, from the audience, history favors those with the loudest microphones. How do we best access these microphones to not silence us? Who in our allies will stand up to amplify our voices and how can we start dismantling and democratizing the connections between politics and media, media funding agencies, distributors, and marketers. It's heavy. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. 
I mean, we're looking for distribution. So anybody out there, you know, we got a dope film. It's won Best of Fest. It's won all kind of awards all over. So that's exactly that's what you have to do. You got to get out there and you got to promote your film and you got to align yourself with good people that believe in your film and don't be afraid to do it. And, you know, that that's one of the things. I mean, I'm saying that jokingly, but I mean, literally, I mean, that's what you have to do. You know, no yeah, one believes in your project like you. So, I mean, this is a great question. This is actually like a systemic question. You know, I think that's a really um, big question that you and all of us are trying to figure out as well. But the biggest thing that I am seeing and that I've just been seeing with my film as well and working with ISF is that the uh, other organizations that are always going to lift us are our own and ourselves, right? So Impact and ISF and, you know, Pillars and all these other organizations that are trying to work um, importance of working together to build and to support. So the only way that I'm seeing is that all of my life and all of my career, you know, being first are so incredibly difficult is um, I'm looking for others to, to, to pull up and to try to uplift us. And that has never worked for me or for anything that I've done. So what we're doing here um, and how we're building each other and how we need to uplift each other and never be in like, not never, but like we should never be in competition with each other, only want the best for each other and to get into these organizations. So as even I'm looking at my film, like, oh, this guy is Muslim. He really, really appreciates your film. He owns this and he's going to help do that, right? And so I think, um, I think it needs to be systemic organizational. And because the Muslim community is so young in America and we're trying to build our, um, our voice after so much coming against us, we have to systemically try to build it up. And so that's just my thought of like open ideas. It's like, we're not saying, not that I'm not giving up on everybody else, but like we're only able to help ourselves in these situations that we have to kind of build it up and really ask for allyship from organizations like Sundance, who is hosting this Muslim house and, you know, can be take the criticism of what we've been saying before um, to, to improve and at the other organizations as well to kind of build um, those together. What are my thoughts? Anybody else have any thoughts? Constructive criticism. Man, I couldn't agree more. I was thinking back to like a comment that Kamau made earlier about like putting grants together and partnering with other filmmakers and finding ways to like create together. And I, I think you're right. Um, a lot of times when communities are disenfranchised, there's this thought to kind of look outside. But we also have uh, an opportunity to look at uh, what resources we have amongst us and what ways we can build up together. I love that. That's, that's really, that sounds good. I have another one here from the audience. What is the best way to be responsible for authorship? Do you think we should be telling our own stories or if we are telling other stories, getting collaborators on board responsibly suffices? What are best practices so that we aren't relegated to just telling our niche? I'm gonna kick this one to Sammy. You've been quiet for a little bit, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think filmmaking, especially documentary filmmaking requires a degree of humility, right? And it, it requires a, a degree of ethics. Um, you know, I, I think with, with Muslim stories, I'm not one to say that only a Muslim could tell a certain story, but say if it was a black Muslim story, um, there are certainly projects that might excite me, but I don't feel like I'm the right filmmaker to tell a story about Malcolm X at this moment in history um, or an indigenous story. I don't, you know, African-American Muslims make up 20% of Muslims and they are uh, underrepresented in Muslim stories. And I thank ISF and MPAC for working to address that. Um, but I mean, back to the code of ethics, the thing that's dangerous right now is that there is this sort of golden age of documentary, right? Um, but at least in a fiction film, it's an actor playing a role. Even if you are, you treat the actor terribly, like Stanley Kubrick and yell at Shelley Duvall, <laughs> it's like Shelley Duvall can, can walk away from that role in The Shining. But if you're, you know, a traumatized person um, who suffered immensely, you can't walk away from that trauma. And there are no ethics about, uh, getting paid for your story. So what is the responsibility you have as a filmmaker, as a human being to, um, you know, to other people? Uh, and I think that's sort of that transactional nature of documentary film 
um, that the the legacy of documentary film in particular, you know, with like Robert Flaherty and Jean Rouge and they sort of that colonizing lens that Kamau was like talking about earlier is like really important um, for decision makers and for all of us as, uh, you know, creatives to take into account. Um, and I, I didn't study, I guess I did. I took a class on documentary filmmaking, but you know, I, I, I'm not like on the graduate level. So I'm not super in the weeds on documentary ethics, but if you want to be, there are people like Sonia Childress, there are organizations like the, the IDA um, that are working on, um, you know, addressing these issues of authorship. Um, and all it requires is like a good, like operating in good faith. <laughs> and I feel like that's another one of the casualties of the Trump era is like, people have like permission to just even from every side of the political divide feel have permission to act in bad faith. But if you're genuinely acting in good faith and you have like good intentions, then reach out, connect with people from that community um, listen to what they're saying about your project. If they have red flags, then you should address them. Um, and you shouldn't force a community onto your territory and your terrain and repeat a sort of traumatizing, colonizing lens. Um, and sadly, uh, not enough of, you know, that's not being talked about enough. I, I mean, I think there's also, there's no, um, there's no shortcut right like there's you, you have to spend the time and i think we've all seen films that are you know very surface level and have um i don't know what you call it, cheap verite if we're talking about documentary filmmaking right where it's not real not real scenes right it's just you can feel in every aspect of the film where it's not actually um like the, there's nothing real about it right it's just like sort of hollowness <clears throat> and there's no there's no real shortcut i guess there's a sort of tangible takeaway from whatever that that question was initially it's you got to spend time there's just no there's no way around it even if you're writing a fiction film man like you could write something that's very surface but getting deep and into the into the wheat it takes it takes it takes time man like you can't you, you could write something or, or go shoot like spend a day with somebody and that relationship isn't there right you're, they're going to give you um a version of themselves that is you know who knows right and you, if you don't spend time talking to them and being with them um, I hate to use the word empathy, but that is sort of a part of it, right? Um, spending time with the person um, and what you do, because there's ways that you can shoot, you know, you can shoot something and think, oh, okay, I have what I need for this scene, you know, <laughs> in this hour, or I could spend, you know, two weeks and it's going to be a different sort of outcome. So uh, there's no shortcuts. You have to pay your dues. Uh, I hear you. It's, it's like when I, as an Arab, hear a little too much. It's like, come on, stop it. It's it's just, it's not real anymore. <laughs> You're overdoing it. So clearly you don't get it. It's not, it's not real. Uh, and so if you don't care about, you know, uh, the, the purpose, the morality, the ethics behind it, don't you want an honest, real story? I mean, in the end, all filmmakers can't disagree with that. So if you don't care for this reason, care for that reason. You should care for both. That's but right. anyway, uh, sorry, my two cents. Um, Folks, we're at 12.09. I'm gonna um, just ask for one last question to be addressed swiftly, which is, you know, let's talk about positive examples. Are there any films in your mind, in your opinion, that properly represent Muslims? And of course, all of your films. Yes, absolutely. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, Go watch Asya's film, The Feeling of Being Watched. I was gonna say, say the same thing. <laughs> Go watch, you know, and Asya mentioned in the chat, it's like to circle back to an earlier question you had, Serene, it's like the importance of ISF is like, that like first money is like, that's what you need to get started. And sometimes that's what Sundance Institute sees and it's like, oh, they've got ISF backing. Let's grant it, The Feeling of Being Watched, uh, Two Gods, Zishan Ali's film, Hamtrak USA, you know, she could be next, Speed Sisters, like there's so many films out there. Um, and uh, I mean, let's, let's, uh, let's do that tomorrow. Let's like use that hashtag, hashtag my Muslim film to, to elevate, um, you know, past films, upcoming films, whatever, and just like, you know, elevate our voices. Can I just, uh, one film that I think that if anyone really wants to know, um, uh, there's a really good film on Muhammad Ali 
that, you know, there's a million documentaries that were made on Muhammad Ali, but one particular one, it was called The Trials of, of Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. And it dealt with his trials that he went through, um, actually not, you know, evading the draft and going to prison and, and being actually, you know, taking his belt away and all the things that he went through. And it was, it's a, such an amazing documentary, but it showed him as a human and how he turned into an activist where people don't realize why he's so famous. It's not from the boxing, it's from him actually, you know, standing up like what we're, what we're doing right now. And, you know, in, in, in the black community, you know, the Muslim community, uh, the black Muslim community, it was the Muslims that stood up that, um, that really paved the way for a lot of the other communities to come in, to wear a hijab, to wear, um, to say your name is Hakeem, to say your name is this. So that, that film was really good. And I think that that's a really good um, film that, it, you know, off the top of my head, it, it really, really hit me hard, you know. I, I wanted to just also say, like uh, Asia Bundawi said, "Jin" by Nigel Mutman, which is a filmmaker we oh, yeah. all love. If you talk about a film that was done on a small budget, like financed by a filmmaker, I think that's a really excellent example. And that was also that. one of our ISF first funded that's films. Right. Is a uh, Jin as well. So, and it's an interesting. Sammy is saying that, and of course, all of the films that were of, of us here um, is now. I've lost my train of thought. Oh, <laughs> is that they're all us Muslim filmmakers, like, I think the question really was asking, are there Hollywood ones? And I think the answer is pretty much no. <laughs> so it's like um, the films that are made by the actual people, they're only happening recently. And those are the ones that you should be looking out for um, and seeing, so. Yeah, and Jin was also a media award winner in 2019. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, and I, Justin I, Mishuk's I, film as well. He was our first film grant recipient on a struggle, yeah. Valley's, I would, uh, I would just sorry to come out. I would like just beg to disagree a little bit with you, Iman, if I could. Oh, of um, course. There are, there are white filmmakers and non-Muslim filmmakers, like someone pointed out in the chat that All That Breathes is by a Hindu filmmaker about two Muslim bird keepers in Sundance. And mm -hmm. I haven't seen it, but everything yeah. I gather is like, uh, you know, beautiful. And, you know, the sort of canonical critiques of the war on terror um, the last 20 years, a lot of them, aside from like Asia's film, uh, have been done by white filmmakers like Laura Poitras, Alex Gibney, Charles Ferguson. Um, there's a way to, to do it. Um, it's just, it doesn't happen often. <laughs> it's been time, time, right time. Yeah. And I would add to that list, The Mauritanian, which is a true story told by the detainee himself um, with um, a white producer and a white director. So there are absolutely ways uh, to do it. Um, I want everybody to know that, and that was honored in the Media Awards, of course, MPAX Media Awards, that film was incredible. Um, the, it's, we can go on forever. This is so rich. This is, you are all such incredible artists um, and creatives and we, I know the audience has so much more they want to um, extract from you, but I want to say first know that MPAC is um, uh, recording today's panel uh, and it will go out to the audience members um, once that gets wrapped up probably next week. And know that, you know, these these words that we talked about today, you know, good faith, um, when, when, when we approach films with good faith, with humility, viewing it through the correct lens. Whoever is holding the camera, it has to be through the correct lens, right? Addressing the red flags raised by the community in a substantive way, addressing them, not brushing them off, but addressing them substantively. Um, and recognizing that our community in particular, it has been subject to trauma, traumatizing experience under the cloak of the military industrial complex, under the black Muslim experience, whether it's, you know, either way we're a threat, you know, whether whatever lens we're viewed through. And it becomes so problematic when that, that is not recognized and that space isn't created to go beyond it. So crafting our own narratives, um, partnering with those who recognize the importance of putting out our own authentic 
real narratives um, are the next steps. And this is just the starting point, folks. This is an incredible community that we are going to continue to work with. Um, and we're so grateful and honored and humbled to be uh, partnered with you. And with that, we do want to thank um, SISF, MPAC, and Sundance for giving us this platform, this space, to be honest and be real and talk about some of the obstacles uh, that we see and hopefully come to the table next to uh, talk about how we're going to overcome many of the obstacles um, that we have uh, touched on today. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your weekends um, and to be continued, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Peace. 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 Thank you, Impact. Thank you, Isa. Yeah. Thank you all.